Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig, and I just wanted to give you an update. Over the last nine months, in large part because of your listener support, we've managed to build this show into one of the top guitar and human interest podcasts online. As a result, we now have openings for a select group of businesses to advertise on and sponsor this show. And I thought you, as a listener, would be in the best position to make recommendations to business owner friends of yours who might benefit from advertising here on the Everyone Loves Guitar Show. So if you know a business owner who might profit from advertising on this show, have them connect with me by going to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertising. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertising. I'd love to have a brief conversation with them to see how we might be able to help. Thanks for your help. And now let's get on with the show. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. We've got a super special guest today, a great guitar player, great songwriter, beautiful singer, somebody I listened to, and, and I mean this positively, when I was a kid, <laughs> uh, just a, a great player of music. I'm trying to make you feel 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 young, Tommy. We're with Tommy Talton. He's the uh, one of the founding members of the band Cowboy and uh, Boyer and Talton. Tommy began his musical career in Central Florida, and in 1966, he was a founding member of a group called We the People. They had several top 10 hits throughout Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky. They were recorded on RCA Victor Records, and they got a lot of critical acclaim, and they're considered to still be in the top three garage band genre groups of all time. In 1970, Tommy, along with Scott Boyer, was a founding member of Capricorn Records group Cowboy. From 71 through 77, Cowboy recorded four albums for Capricorn. They were Reach for the Sky, Five Will Get You Ten, Boyer and Talton Cowboy, and then just the last album was called Cowboy. Tommy also recorded an album called Happy to Be Alive by Talton, Sandlin, and Stewart with producer Johnny Sandlin. He worked with the Allman Brothers quite frequently in Delbert and Clinton. In Macon, Georgia, through most of the 70s, Tommy was a studio musician recording with artists like Billy Joe Shaver, Bonnie Bramlett, Martin Mull, Corky Lang from Mountain, uh, or West Bruce and Lang, I should say, Greg Allman, Dickie Betts, Clarence Carter, country music legend Kitty Wells, Alex and Livingston Taylor, Arthur Conley of Sweet Soul Music fame, Johnny Rivers, and more. He toured extensively throughout the U.S. with Cowboy and with Greg Allman's Laid Back Tour as Greg's special guest, and they play from Carnegie Hall to the Fillmore West in San Francisco and most cities in between. Tommy was also the guitarist on Greg's uh, Certified Gold Laid Back Studio album. Throughout the 90s, Tommy lived and toured in Europe. You know, I, I got to ask you something about that. Actually, I just thought of that. Anyway, he lived and toured in Europe, and he formed a group there called the Rebelizers with members of Albert Lee's band, and th those guys were called Hogan's Heroes. Also, at that time, he was guitarist on a Belgian television program, Sommer Curin, and uh, he played with numerous European musicians such as Toots Thielmans, which is a jazz harmonica player, while gigging throughout France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, and Spain. Last year, Tommy released his fifth album of all original songs. It's called Somewhere South of Eden. It's a really cool record, and we'll discuss that record today. And Tommy continues touring the Southeast with occasional visits to Chicago, New York, and Europe as a soloist and with a full band of three to six pieces. Tommy, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you taking the time to do that. I love it. Thanks for uh, asking me, Craig. Uh, you know, I was listening to that. I was going, man. I guess I'm not as lazy as I thought I was. <laughs> you know, everybody says that, man. Like, wow, I, I, did, like, a, I did a lot I, of shit. <laughs> I didn't know all that went on. Who, man, who did that? <laughs> yeah. You know what, too, man, and I'm not blowing smoke, your voice on Somewhere South of Eden, it's like I, I, when I put – you know, five will get you 10 on my turntable ah. sounded the same. Man. Uh, so whatever you're doing. It's funny. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Keep, um, keep it. Let me know. Let's figure out how to sell that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all the good music you made. I have, like I said, I have five will get you 10 and I wore the grooves off that record when I first had it. Uh, ah, thank I, you. You're welcome. The last four songs on side two are as fine a group of songs from that era as you'll find great great record what uh, what were the last four songs you the last know four the i will tell you right now i'll pull up my trusty itunes and uh here you go they were all my friends innocent oh, song yeah. 
Please Be With Me and What I Want Is You. Another song I like on there is uh, the one, I think you wrote it, The Wonder. I think we'll have a question. No, I, I actually, I didn't write that. In fact, that's the one song on there that none of us wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, a friend of ours in Tallahassee, Florida, wrote that, John McKenzie. And, uh, yeah, it's one of the few – I I don't know if we ever recorded uh, – ever again recorded a song that uh, wasn't written by either Scott or I or Bill Pilmore or Pete Kowalke. Pretty song. The whole, the whole album is really cool. Like I said, it's such a, you know, when I think of that record, part of what I like about it is the nostalgia of that era. Yeah. And there's, there is speaking of the innocence song, there is innocence there in the playing and it, yeah. well, we were 20 years old, you know, we were 20, 20, 21 years old, and, uh, of course, uh, I mean, it, recording was nothing new to Scott and I, um, nothing new to me for sure. I mean, when you first mentioned We the People, you know, I was like uh, 15 years old when we were first went to uh, Criteria in Miami to do our first <laughs> recording. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, when we walked in the – in the room in the studio the second day out in the lobby, uh, I walk in and there sits, uh, Wayne, uh, the white James Brown, Wayne, uh, get down with it. He, it was his big hit. He Wayne, big, Wayne, Wayne Newton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I kept wanting to say Newton, but it, no, it wasn't Newton. Uh, oh, I know, he was I know. definitely not the white James Brown. <laughs> yeah, <he>? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Him and Barry Manilow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, don't. <laughs> I mean, no harm. No, no. Uh, hey, you're going to offend uh, somebody no matter what you say, so don't worry about yeah, it. I promise. It's all in good fun. I mean, uh, <laughs> anybody can say anything they want about me, and I hope that I can do the same. But <laughs> You can hear. <laughs> uh, what was his damn name? Wayne. He had a huge Elvis pompadour blonde. I, I don't even think it was a wig either. Um, it could have been. Uh I'm going to have to Google that while we're talking later. But uh, anyway, he was sitting there in the lobby and it was like uh, mind boggling to me because that's the kind of stuff I was listening to back then. A lot of white people didn't even know about him um, or James Brown. And um, my high school band, we played a lot of James Brown music. I snuck into a uh, to a, a, a all black nightclub back then, you know, back in those days. This is um, up in Georgia? No, this is in Central Florida in okay. Altamont Springs near um, – Yeah, I know. It's just in south of – or just north of Orlando, right? Yeah. yeah. It's uh, Orlando, Winter Park, Altamont Springs, uh-huh. Maitland. That's Wayne, all. That's Wayne Cochran, by the way. It is. Wayne Cochran. Get down with it. You I need remember, to listen I, to that. I remember that song, actually. Yeah. Uh, so he was sitting in the lobby and me, you know, a kid who – been hearing him he was like one of my guys who i went man he's got it and look at his hair yeah look at that hair uh but anyway um i got off on this because i was talking about um beginning recording and um some of the cool i know one of your um questions you sent me was something about uh you know, something that someone is advice I've gotten through the years or something like that. Yeah. Uh, best advice you've gotten. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I can't hone in on any one thing, but generally, you know, there's been a bunch of it from, you know, just from uh, working with so many wonderful people. And I was fortunate to work with, but at 50, at 16 years old, uh, I was recording um, with we, the people, and we were in, Studio B in Nashville, Tennessee for RCA Victor Records. And um, I mean, thinking back on it now, it was pretty crazy. We were standing in the, I was standing on the same spot that Elvis stood at when he recorded most of his hits back in the 50s. And 
now that 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 studio in fact is not i don't believe they even use it it's just a museum kind of thing where you get tours and walk through it but uh, not only did we record in there most of our stuff but charlie mccoy played bass for us and harmonica a lot he's a um he's like a an extreme capital l legend in nashville uh, among studio musicians and um and Felton Jarvis, who also produced Elvis, um, was producing us there for a while. We were mostly produced by a guy named Tony Moon, who lived in Nashville and had a uh, a booking agency and publishing company there. But uh, that's how we got connected with Nashville. And we went up. We went. We went and played gigs in Nashville. We were the first long hairs to to be in town, you know. And uh, we caught a lot of a lot of strange looks nashville wasn't so friendly back then yeah yeah I imagine. Sort of long-haired kid that wanted to play some music but uh we backed up steve uh good grief steve not steve. senility okay did you did steve warner you ever run into steve warner because he recorded uh, rca on, that was his first label uh steve smith is a guy that was uh on that I ran into a lot, but he was working with Tony Moon. Warner, no, I don't believe we ever met, but I know who you're talking about. But um, no, I'm talking about uh, uh, Ray Stevens, not Steven, Ray Stevens. Gotcha. We backed him up and did Ahab to Arab and, and all that stuff, you know, with him. And uh, again, I was like 16 years old and, and I couldn't believe uh, – I didn't even have time to think about what was going on. We just did it. Um, someone asked me a while back, uh, you know, what what made you decide to take up a life of music? Well, I never did decide that. I had no choice. Um, all of a sudden, I was just doing it. I mean, literally, it's so many things in my life has worked that way. The way I met Scott Boyer, the way I met Dwayne Allman. How, how'd you meet Dwayne and Greg? Uh, Dwayne and Greg were, uh, you know, back in 1965, everybody on earth wasn't a musician, you know? Mm. And, uh, and in central Florida, there were only, uh, I don't know uh, what, 15 bands that were probably actually working bands that you could see in, in, uh, youth centers and, uh, uh, later on, little rock and roll clubs like places called the the Tiki Hut and the Tiger's Den is where I played uh, a lot with uh, the Almond Joys. Yeah, uh, Dwayne and Greg uh, were playing. It was Cocoa Beach, and uh, I would come. Our band would come over from Orlando, and they would come down for, over from Daytona, and. Uh, We'd do a gig and the kids would all pay a dollar to get in. And man, at 16 years old, I'd walk home every weekend with a wad of dollar bills because we got paid with uh, by the cash that came in the door, right? Sure. So uh, that was fun, and uh, that's how that's how Greg and, and Dwayne and I first met. And Scott Scott and Butch and David Brown when they were in the 31st of February. Uh, same time period, um, you know, we shared a couple gigs and we never were around each other long enough to know each other that well then, but um, fate brought us back together, you know, a year later or so. And uh, a mutual friend introduced Scott and I, and on and on it went like that. But I, as far as making a decision, as far as I knew, till I was about 13 or 14, I, there was no doubt in my mind I was going to be a professional baseball player. That was oh, all wow. I thought. Yeah, that's all I thought about. And, uh, and girls. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I was very athletic back then, and, and I, I was track and field and baseball, and that's all I thought about until – until I was at my uncle Frankie's house, my uncle, my Italian uncle Frankie, who I'm named after, Frank Thomas, um, he always had little knickknacks sitting around, and uh, 
I find out now, I realize what it was. When I was about eight years old, I went into his house and opened a guitar case that was sitting on the floor. And uh, I opened it up and just stared at it. And it, it had a silver reflective body, which I know, now know was a national steel dobro. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had no idea then, of course. And I just, I remember... I remember leaning over and plucking the high E string of the dobro and just standing there and watching it vibrate like in a trance. And, and I thought, man, I've got somewhere in me, there was this desire to, I've got to find out what's going on in this world right here, you know? And uh, I just told that story to Derek trucks just like three weeks ago. I was down at his place and for some reason that came up in conversation. We were talking about the first time he played Dobro. Yeah. I handed him his Dobro and and said, I had a friend who had sold vintage instruments and, uh, Derek was 10. (laughs) And, uh, I said, I said to my friend, Tony, I said, man, Derek's over here. He's playing at a club. This was down in Orlando. And, uh, He's never played a dobro, so could you, you got one you could bring over? And he brought over this really beautiful, I think it was like a 1932, and uh, on the back of it was this beautiful in-color uh, woman skiing across the the surface of the water with palm trees in the background. On the dobro? Yeah. Wow. That's- yeah, it was on the back of the dobro, and... Uh, I'll have to ask him where that thing ended up. But of course, you know, we handed it to Derek and like 15 minutes later, he was playing like a 75 year old black man that had been doing it all of his life. Yeah. Well, he's like, un- <laughs> you know, he's off the, he's not of this earth when it comes to that. I mean, he's yeah, it's got crazy. a gift, you know, that that's extremely unique. Yeah. Um. Hey, you mentioned Scott earlier and you know and I, first of all my condolences i know you lost him earlier this year yep yep you want that to talk hard about, oh i can't imagine you know um do you want to talk about your musical relationship or the friendship you guys shared over the years oh well i mean yeah i mean i don't i really don't know what to say we were so close um i guess you can already hear it in my voice yeah uh I don't know what to say, really, except that we were just so close that um, it was something we never even talked about. We never uh, again it goes back to what I said earlier um, about having to make decisions. I don't even know what it's like for um, someone to have to to decide what am I going to do with my life? Because I I never had to decide and neither did Scott. Um, We were just we were just led into it little by little um, along the way. And um, suddenly we were introduced by a mutual friend. Um, uh, I was told that there was this guy uh, and, and like I said, we'd met before. I said, yeah, I've heard his name. He was in a band. uh, We shared a show once, but we didn't know each other. And uh, I was told, yeah, he's, he writes songs uh, as good as you do. And I said, I hate him already. And, uh, <laughs> not really. But um, he, uh, she said he plays and writes his own stuff. And at this time I was not used to that. Everybody I met was doing Bob Dylan songs or learning uh, as Martin Mull once said, learning licks off of records that I've heard. But um so it was real nice to to be hooked up with someone who was creating and uh and then uh, we literally we sat down in in the kitchen of the house we were at and we each had our acoustic guitars and Scott played um Sorry. You all right, man? Yeah. Yeah. Scott played uh, "Living in the Country" for me. It's the first song. It was on our first album. Uh, it's the first song he ever played that I heard um, that he had written, and then I played one for him. Um, I forget what it was, 
probably something like uh, Pretty Friend, which was also on our first album. And uh, we just looked at each other and said, all right, who are we getting for piano, drums, <laughs> bass? And three months later, we had that all together. Tom went on drums from Orlando, who I knew, who was in We the People with me, and George Clark, who was in a rival band. Uh, he was in a band called Plant Life in Orlando, and Plant Life and We the People were kind of like the uh, the deal down there in Orlando, Florida, for a while. So uh, George Clark, who who was one of the most wonderful people I've ever met, too. He uh, he and I were real close. Um, he has passed on also. He passed on about six months after those 2008 recordings that we did. Um, tell you the truth, it's, it's – I don't remember when it was that he passed. Just how much – uh, another one that hurt a lot. But um, anyway, he was on bass, and we got – Bill Pilmore was someone that Scott knew, um, who he had written a lot of songs with. Bill came in, and he was in Jacksonville. Scott was in Jacksonville. And Pete Kowalki, who uh, joined us uh, through Scott and Bill. And uh, we all moved up to Jacksonville and rented a house together and threw newspapers at night through the Jacksonville Journal at 2 a.m., and uh, the rest of the time we spent playing music and working up those songs that you said you love so much. I can't believe you, you guys are all so young. Yeah, well, yeah. Amazing. It's Different world. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the, nowadays, uh, well, gosh, what Justin Bieber, uh, what was he yeah, that's true. He, that, that's true. That's very true. I uh, mean, it's yeah. it all it all kind of goes that way. Yeah. Everybody. Uh, Paul Anka was like fifteen when he wrote his first hit, Diana. I think. Yeah, you're, and you know what? I interviewed. Do you know Billy Vera? Billy Vera. I don't know Vera. him, but I know Rick Rick Hirsch extremely well. And okay, uh, he's told me a couple things about Billy. Yeah, right. Those guys know each other. Um, yeah, he Billy was. With, yeah. yeah, Billy was like same, like fifteen, fourteen when he started performing it, but New York. So I guess you're right. It's it's it's, it, it, that's it's the youth, goes. you know, the yeah. youth. That, uh, I mean, the Beatles. Uh, uh, gosh, when let me see when uh, when uh, I want to hold your hand came out in the state. Well, the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. What was John Lennon the eldest, or Ringo was the eldest, right? Um, what was he? He was probably twenty two. Yeah. Twenty three. Yeah, well, this guy started started playing uh yeah, you're right. They were very young. Just yeah, I guess you're right. Um let me ask you this and and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, because I mean this with all the respect in the world. I thought Cowboy was a great man and it seemed like everything was lined up. Like Dwayne Allman encouraged Capricorn to sign you. He yeah. played on five. I'll get you ten. Yeah, you guys opened for the brothers. You played for Greg, okay, yeah. and you played on 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 the Almond uh, Brothers and Sisters record. Everybody's yeah. playing was great. Your playing was great on guitar. Singing was great. Songwriting was great. Even Clapton recorded one of your songs. Please be with me. Yeah, you had a top producer in Johnny Sandlin, and obviously the label thought highly enough to send you guys to record over in Muscle Shoals. Well, the reason, excuse me, the reason yeah. we went to Muscle Shoals was uh, was purely because Capricorn was being uh, redesigned and under construction. So, okay, uh, that's why we went to Muscle Shoals, which I'm glad we did. Yeah, what a cool experience! But yeah. for most people, you guys are more like a a best kept secret. Yeah. The. Yeah. And like the I, most popular band you've never heard. Yeah, it was you know, and I'm I was curious if. And I said this in the questions. I have another artist that I have an interview with, and it was a little later, but the same thing happened to this person, and he was on Capricorn. So I'm just curious, did the label not like do their job? And I'm not looking to get gossip or dirt, but I'm just like, I can't believe why you guys 
we're not, you know, the next all, you know, not the next all bros, but you know what I'm saying? The next, you know, yeah. somebody was well, opening for we, you. Yeah. Well, we obviously were not, uh, in the, uh, high energy Southern rock, uh, genre. I mean, they called us Southern rock because they didn't know what else to call us. Uh, Greg, both Greg and I have always said, uh, um, uh, Southern rock is, I mean, we just never liked that phrase, but I guess you got to label it something. So that's what it became. It was rock and it was in the South. So there you right. go. But I mean, you, but, look, uh, to, you, you look at, to me, I, I you know, the, the Eagles, some of the old Eagles stuff. Is well, like, I was just going to say, Chris, Jackson you, Brown, you know? Yeah. I was going to say, um, quite frankly, I think what it was, was that um, Capricorn just simply didn't know uh, how to handle us because we were not in that um, that vein of the Marshall Tucker, the um, Wet Willie, the um, Almond Brothers. We were more we were more a California type deal, yeah. You know? And um, they were uh, Phil Walden and Associates thought in terms of like you know how they how they treated Otis Redding and the brothers. It's like you know. Um, just uh, go out there and work every day and uh, stay on the road and um, and eventually, uh, you know, s- something may happen. It's like, uh, but pretty much uh, there were some things that happened that were just unbelievable to me. Um, I remember the uh, actually the last album we did in 77 when actually that was when the decline of Capricorn was very obvious then. And uh, I think I, they went, they went out. I don't, do you know what year they, uh, no, bankruptcy? it's probably 78 or something. I don't know. But, um, uh, I got word that, um, the biggest uh, FM station, you know, and back then FM was, was like the deal. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the biggest FM station in Los Angeles, California was, was playing uh, the single that was released off of that last album we did. It was called taking it all the way. And uh, it was a very poppy uh, thing. I just re I just heard it just the other day because those, those albums have been re-released. I, I checked it out. I haven't listened to that stuff in so long. Man, everything is so up and high for little kids. So excited. But uh, it was, you know, it was a pop song, but uh, it was being played. There were only two uh, artists being played more than they were rotating that song. And that was Queen and Linda Ronstadt, I was told. Okay. And this is the biggest FM station in L.A. And uh Rather than sending us out there and uh, working it and, you know, going to the record to Tower Records and signing uh, albums and stuff. Uh, I don't know where we were. we were probably up in Providence, Rhode Island, you know, or something playing. Uh, who knows? But there were some mistakes made and I, I there's no need for blame or anything else. No. What happened happened and all that. And, um, you know. I'm fortunate enough to, uh, you know what, Craig, the uh, coolest thing is, is I don't know how many people can say that uh, they've had people come up to them and I've had people come up to me shaking and say, I can't tell you what your music has done for my life. And um, one guy at the Fillmore East, this kid from Brooklyn came up to me after our set. He said, I just bought your album and I just wanted to let you know that when I put it on the spindle and I, and I, and it starts, that plastic starts turning around. He said, uh, it's a lot more than a piece of plastic. He said, your lyrics and your, your music changed my life for the better, you know? Very cool, man. So when you hear stuff like that, all the money in the world couldn't really, uh, replace uh, knowing that you have helped somebody in their life you know you mentioned the Fillmore East I know you played East and West what was a big difference between those two uh, not necessarily the venues but the audiences there 
Oh, that's like night and day, really. I mean, um, the it's the same as it is today. New York City versus San Francisco, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's obvious, you know, the 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 hyperness that's there in New York is. Well, I haven't been in San Francisco in a while, but I doubt that they're real hyper out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't think. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Hey, man, let's let's walk down to the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so they were just like obviously uh, much more mellow out there, and laid yeah, back the, and- the the whole audience thing was uh, uh, much more mellow. And in fact, we we had a. a, a I got a good Bill Graham story for you. Uh, Great, because I was going to ask you about that right afterwards. Go ahead. We we were up playing, and it was, believe it or not, it was a a great booking. Somebody really thought about this one. It was Cowboy and Blood Rock. I don't know Blood Rock, man. Blood Rock. They had a song called DOA, Dead on Arrival. Mm -hmm. They were a very hard rock. Uh. They were hard, and they were like the opposite of cowboy, mm-hmm. and and they had us on the same show, man, and and we went out and opened the show, and some people were were like not very respectful, and you know, in between, most, I must say the the major uh, the major bit of the audience they were listening and respectful. Um, but there were some loud mouths out there who were you know, yelling, get off the stage. We want blood rock, you know, shit like that. And uh, this, is, this is a East or West East. Okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> and uh, so Graham bill comes out all of a sudden he, I feel the air move next to me and he's, he has run by me and it's go grabs the microphone and he, and he starts telling the audience, man, you listen to me. He's saying to the entire audience, y'all, uh, he didn't say y'all. No, he didn't say y'all. You, you people, you people need to understand that I opened this place to bring you the best music that I think you should hear. And it's worthwhile. Everything that I bring in this room is worthwhile for you to listen to. And if you don't understand that and you can't give the people that I bring in this room respect, then you go home and get out of here right now. I'll give you your money back. You go home and you listen to your goddamn 45 records. Wow. That is so cool. Yeah. And some guy stupidly said something in the audience to that. And within seconds, security had him up out of his seat, uh, carrying him to the front door and literally threw him out on the street from uh, physically. Wow. You, could, you know, I, I, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. That's it. I say, I've, I've seen interviews with him and documentaries extensively because I've always been interested in him because I thought he was a fascinating character. He was a great man. He was a lovely man. I loved him. But there seem to be two sides to him, like the side that you're describing now. And then and I don't know who got to see what side. There was a very like, well, I can tell you, you saw the bad, the the you saw the anger come out of him when when he saw that that you did not respect what he thought you should respect. And and you didn't give respect and you had no respect and you were, you know. A knucklehead. He didn't like knuckleheads, you know, and he wouldn't stand for it. And he wouldn't stand for people who who uh, do nothing but spout negativity. You know, that's where he was at. Yeah. And he so, didn't hold back, you know. So you had a real good experience in dealing with Bill. Yeah. Another time out on the West Coast, uh, this time it was with uh, the laid back tour and uh, – we were all out on the stage getting ready to start the night out on the, uh, at, at, uh, the Fillmore West and, um, uh, Bill comes out to introduce us. And uh, it turns out that that night at the same time, strangely enough, across the Bay in Oakland, he was, uh, also promoting a show with George Harrison. That's weird. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> 
And, you know, nowadays people would go, what? You're competing with yourself with a beetle over there and you're, uh, and you got another show going on over here with Greg. Yeah, that wouldn't be cool. And, uh, but back then apparently, uh, he thought, why not? And, uh, he seemed to usually know what he was doing, but anyway, that was what was going on. And, uh, he walked by me as he was going to the, to introduce us at the front of the stage <laughs> And as he walked by, he hit me, he slapped me in the butt and whispered in my ear and said, Tommy, how does it feel? You guys just outsold one of the Beatles. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, wow. Yeah, but it was funny. He just, it all happened within a split second. You know, he was walking, didn't even break stride. He, Slapped me on the butt, and then when he was like passing me, he put his hand up and said, "How does it feel? You guys just outsold one of the Beatles." And then he went on his merry way, kept going. And then he went on and introduced the uh, the laid back tour. Wow, what what did you learn most from your experience with Cowboy? Either like musically or business wise, or you know, performance wise, or even life wise in general. Um, there was a lot learned there. Um, it was, um, it was a pretty, it, it was a, it was a unique situation the way, um, we were all there at, at just the right time and, and, and everybody had, there were a lot of different personalities in Cowboy. Um, uh, you know, there was the extreme laid back and the stream, you know, uh, I was probably the most hyper, uh, although most people who know me now or even back then would think, wow, yeah, if you, you were the most hyper, hyper <laughs> if you were the most hyper, those guys were half dead. But, uh, yeah, you seem pretty laid back, man. To be, I was kind of <laughs> confused when you said that. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I was an excitable boy, mm. but, it, but, um, you know, but it all fit together well. It, it, it all was necessary to bring about the the beautiful music we made. I mean, I, I'm not even uh, I, I don't think I'm not saying that in an egotistical way that the music that we made. I know I, I I'm not in any wonder as to why people like it. And what's really funny is it was proof that um, the technical side of music has nothing to do with what is important to what music can bring people. Because as far as uh, being virtuosos on our instruments, none of us were, uh, were that. And, um, you know, I mean, we were creative maybe, and we were, uh, we did what we could uh, as we thought of it. And, and as we created it, uh, you know, we got better at it because we just did it. Um, am I making sense here? Yeah, totally. You're like uh, saying that uh, what's important is what's coming out of your instrument and how you're touching well, somebody. You don't need to be, yeah. you know. I mean, you can play, you can play. Well, I'm sorry to quote myself, but I, I even said it in one of our songs. Uh, there's a song called Everything Here that's, that was on, I think, the first album. And, uh, there's a line in it that says, uh, don't you do that, boy, you're worrying. So you're complicating every little thing. You ain't got to play so many notes if you get what each note brings. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Um, uh, but the way that it all came together was just fun. I mean, we were all, no one was, uh, it wasn't like, what can we do here to have a hit record? Nobody ever thought like that, <laughs> which is why we probably never did have one. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, we were all in it for the music. And that's what comes through on especially, well, I, I teach his own, but most people prefer the first two albums because of the innocence that's there and the vulnerability that can be heard and the and the beauty of the harmonies and such yeah you know? i would say that 
and lyrically, uh, there were some, uh, as, as the kid told me at the Fillmore East, you know, it, it helped change some people's lives if they listen to the music. I've always been a big, um, I vote for a song having good lyrics. Um, I mean, I want a good beat, just like they always did on American Bandstand. But um, after you've heard the beat and after you've heard you've gotten off on the the crazy guitar solo and after you're over listening to the cool licks on the drums uh, or piano, whatever, after all that is out of the way, you can listen to it again and go to another level and go, wow, I didn't realize they were they were saying that. You know, hmm. uh, I've always thought it's great. Uh, I'm sure you've done this from your curiosity. Uh, but when you see lyrics to any song written in black and white, rather than hearing them sung. Oh, yeah, man. Or spoken, they have such more impact uh, written down in black and white than they do uh, just floating through the air into your ear, you know. I, and I still do that. Just yesterday, I, I, you know, I don't remember what song it was. Uh, I always look up lyrics. I think it was, uh, it was just some song I heard from a, a, a TV show the night before that I liked it. And uh, I looked at uh, that's everything. I mean, you know, that, that allowed for me anyway. I, and I think a lot of people are like this. That is where I, I get to learn and I get to like feel that connection with the, the artist or the person singing that, you know, deeper. Yeah, yeah. I think so for me anyway. But Yeah, um, I think it's true of everybody. Hey, I'd like to ask you about that one of the favorite one of my favorite cowboy songs and then talk about a few songs from your latest album because I really enjoyed it. Um I I mentioned earlier The Wonder. It's from 5 will get you 10 and the lyrics speaking of lyrics, where is the wonder that could weave us all together. I hope that it's not gone forever. What were you guys talking about in that line from the chorus? Well, as I said, that was written by John McKenzie, uh, yeah. a friend of ours. And uh, I don't know, to, to me, the wonder is like, where is that? Where is that compassion and understanding that should be and can be between us all that could weave us all together. Um, uh, I hope it's not gone forever is a very optimistic thing. Yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know when it was ever there in terms of everyone being together, but, um, but that's as simple as that. The wonder is that, understanding and compassion between people that very well could be there. The only thing, the only reason it's not there is because no one lets it be there. Um, as naive as that sounds, it's really, I think it's true. Uh, yeah, this could have been written last week. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, serious, and, you know, and, sadly. And, uh, and the soldier, what, how, what is it? This And the soldier, uh, Shoot, can't remember it now. The uh, where's the one? Uh, the last verse is something about that. And the soldier with his armor lays down his. You know, I could. I I tried to find the lyrics online. I couldn't find it. It kept. They kept coming up with something called "The Wonder Years" by Cowboy Killers. So it was like I was. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, <laughs> I kept getting frustrated, man, because I really that that's a perfect example of what you're saying. Because I when I was you know I had listened to this song years ago, and I said, man, let me listen to the let me get the full lyrics, and sure enough, I couldn't find it. But I, you know, that was such a beautiful line in the in the chorus, man. Um, yeah, I've got it. I'm looking in my documents right now. I've I don't have the uh, lyrics. I've just got the song here right now uh while you're looking go ahead. five will get you ten man that is one of the coolest album names 
And I never ask, I rarely, I should say never, I rarely ask about names because everybody does it. I don't like being like everybody. But where the hell did that name come from? Five will get you 10. Well, it came from a song that I wrote, uh, Five Will Get You Ten. And um, the song I wrote one day, uh, you know, when we were living in Macon at the beginning, uh, when we had just moved up there. By the way, when we moved up to Macon from Jacksonville to do our first album, that was the first I'd ever uh, – well, Dwayne said – he was on his way back to Macon after he stopped in by our house in Jacksonville. And he said, man, you got to check out these cats up in Macon. Uh, they got this record company and da, 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 da. Uh, uh, that's the first time I even heard of Macon, Georgia. I never heard of it growing up, even though Otis Redding was, was, uh, from Jeffersonville right near there. I think it was Jeffersonville. And, uh, and of course that's where Phil who, put Otis on the map or help put him on in front of the international scene. Uh, we were living in Macon though. And in I Macon. remember I had, I had this uh, weird thing about Atlanta, I, which is where I live now. Well, North of it in Marietta, but I spend a lot of time in Atlanta and, um, uh, I had this thing like it was almost like Sin City, you know, like uh, Graham Parsons song, you know, <laughs> on the 34th, 36th floor. Uh, but I, I really didn't like coming to Atlanta. We were doing some gigs here um, and uh, we were driving to Atlanta from Macon. And it was uh, as the song said, the lyric says, the rain came down all over. We were slipping side to side on the road. And then um, same, some days you don't look up. And today was like a day that it showed, which is just my trying to get through my optimism. Uh, of we can make it through the rain and, and all that. But it was also about um, my views on reincarnation and what we go through here in life on this I hope I'm not getting too heavy with you. On no, the, man. These, I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions about that. Go ahead. These uh, these planes that we live on, you know, as we are in different uh, stages of evolution and involution um, uh, and learning uh, the lessons of the universe as you go through life and uh, hopefully learning something and um, – uh, five will get you 10 is a pretty good bet that you're going to come back again. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. And learn more your next time around. So, so is what, is, what time around do you think this is for you? Wow. That's, that's an unanswerable question there. I, I, I don't think it can even put, be put in terms of, Years or numbers, I would say. Uh, I don't know, man. What? What? You, what? Uh, which one are you on? <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm having a hell of a time getting through my first. I don't really know if I can handle more than one. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, man. Uh, let's talk about somewhere south of Eden. Yeah. Which could also be a a topic of reincarnation. Yes. Um, great mix, super clean. Uh, I was curious where you recorded at, and did you mix and engineer this, or did you have someone else come in and do that? Well, I was in, involved in all the all the aspects of the record, but I had uh, I couldn't have done it without uh, first of all David Pinkston, an old friend who was a. Uh, uh, an assistant engineer for a while with Johnny Sandlin and Sam Whiteside at Capricorn records. And, um, so David and I have known each other, uh, since like 1973, four or five, somewhere around there. And, uh, he lives up, uh, in the Nashville suburbs and, uh, he's got, he had a, a nice little, uh, recording room that, uh, I went up 
and did uh, that's how I started the whole process. I went up and in two days I had uh, Chris Donahue, a bass player uh, that plays. Uh, he's done a lot of stuff, but he's also plays bass with uh, Emmy Lou Harris's band and um, Brian Owings. Uh, one of my favorite drummers ever, if not the favorite uh, that I played with a lot. Um, he uh, he plays with Emmy Lou also, but he also uh, this is funny. I, I've always thought this is great. Him and Tony Joe White go around the world as a duet. Uh, Tony Joe White with a drummer, period, and that's that's the show and uh tony joe and his wah-wah pedal and uh, his wonderful low down voice and uh, yeah and and brian on drums but um the three of us got together there at david pinkston's studio called boomtown records uh recording studios and um uh, some of these songs were not even finished yet and i and many of them had no lyrics. I just wanted to get a good feel going between bass, drums, uh, and and I would I played uh, acoustic guitar, and uh, they were all what what we call scratch scratch uh, parts that would be eliminated uh, later on in the process. But I played um, to show them. Let I would say while we were recording, let's go to a verse here. Off the top of my head, that's how the arrangements on many of these came up. Uh, mm. let, let's go to a chorus now. All right, bring this bring this up dynamically here. We're we're in a guitar solo, you know. And yeah, I really had to just kind of go through it and kind of foresee the future or where it would lead us, and uh, and then hopefully have something to put there later on in the process, which, um, which is what I did. I was going to do it up, continue it up there, but it was just such a long tri uh, trip to go back and forth to Nashville from uh, where I live, three and a half hours. I found a friend, Markham White, who has a studio here just 15 miles from me. Hmm. And that's where I did all the overdubbing and um, all the wonderful uh, – Organ work by Steve Kahn, who is a wonderful, wonderful man uh, and a great player. Are you familiar with Steve? I'm not. The only Kahn I'm familiar with was uh, the guy who played with Jerry Garcia. Well, I think he's passed, actually. But Steve is a – he plays accordion and organ and piano. And, uh, he's from down near the Baton Rouge area, and he plays a lot. If you hear keyboards on a – Sonny Landreth album, you're probably hearing Steve Kahn. Oh, okay. And uh, he also played with Bonnie Raitt many years ago. But anyway, he put some organ on, and we did that by uh, – I would send him – Markham White was uh, uh, the fellow who has helped me out with all the overdubs and and helped me with from his studio that's just, as I said, 15 miles from my house. And uh, that's where I did all the overdubs. Wrote lyrics after the tracks had been cut. Um, I didn't have any any. I had I think a half a verse to South of Eden before the track. Wait a minute, uh, you wrote the lyrics for this after? Yes, I had wow. the title. I had the title, and I had a few lines, and that was it. Is that and, typical? This seems like it's a lot more difficult to do, doesn't it? No, actually, I've, I've done that a couple times. Um, no, it's not normal, uh, but then neither am I uh, <laughs> wow. on many different levels. Um, it's kind of fun to do. It's kind of like doing a crossword puzzle. You know, you have this much space. Well, yeah, your real estate's predefined. In. Yes, which is kind of helpful in many ways. It's mm. like... Instead of wondering, you know, wandering off and saying too much, you've got to edit and become more specific um, because, you know, the foundation is laid and uh, you got to put a wall up where the edge of the foundation is. You know? Wow. Is that the first time you've ever done it? Have you done that many times? No, no. I did that on that. 
Happy to Be Alive album that you mentioned. There were a couple songs on there, uh, Stalemate Blues, especially. There's a song on there called Stalemate Blues. And I remember we did the entire track to that, and I didn't have one word written to it. Wow. And I took it home after we had the track and sat and listened to it and just started writing. Uh, that title song, Somewhere South of Eden. Yeah. It's some beautiful slide on there you open up with. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that also uh, was added after the track was cut. Is, is that you? That's you playing, though. Yeah, that's me on the organ and on the on the uh, slide. Yeah, because I'll tell you why that happened was um, South of Eden. You've heard it, so you know that it it. Ha- it it sits in a really, uh, I don't want to say not bad weird, but it's its a place unto itself. And, um, you know, when you're putting a, 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 a bunch of songs together, you have to kind of think, where's the flow going? It's very important. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's what, sh- what should be first? What should come after that? What sometimes I do it by uh, what key they're in or what rhythm is going on or what feels lyrically like it should lead into the next statement. But uh, so South of Eden, I already had that from where it starts from. There's a, a drum lick that goes. But boom, 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 boom. You know, when that starts, that that was the track. But before that, I thought I told Markham, I said, man, this this song sits in such a strange place. I don't know what song would lead the listener into this feel and get and make and the listener be ready to hear this. So I said, I've got to put an intro on this that kind of pulls people into this oh, world. Okay. That's interesting how that, okay. So these, this is what I like, man. This is all the little like inside secrets that I, you know, you don't get sort of exposed or privy to that. So you added that. So, so that, that it can, the listener would be pulled in and get ready for what they were about to hear. Man, that is so clever. I'm not, again, I'm not just like saying the guy that's, that's, I'm sure that's a songwriting thing, but you know, I'm not a songwriter. So I think that's really smart. Well, very cool, man. And you know, nice. I noticed you did that old school. Like if this was a, an album, that would be the last song on side one. You know, it's a long song. That's kind of like old school. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And you used to put the big hit, yeah. the last song on side one. Um, right. re- your vocals were like, I would say, there were, there were great vocals in there, but you sang very melancholy, which sort of fits the music. You know, I thought well, it was very apropos. If I remember right, I think I, um, I think I sang that twice and didn't go back and redo anything. Um, uh, and that was, uh, I must say, um, Markham, uh, was the one who helped me, uh, decide that that's the way it would, we would leave it. You know, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to try again or try or change a couple lines. And he said, I don't think you should, Tommy. I think, he, I think you got it. Why, why change it? Which is funny that it reminds me, uh, you know, the, just the other, not just two nights ago, by the way, man, I, I was with Warren Haynes and I played with government mule here in Atlanta. Oh, and, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, very cool. And, uh, Warren's one of the best, man, one of the greatest guys ever. And, uh, just so friendly, but we were talking before the show and, uh, he was talking about, we were, we were discussing, you know, redoing this and that and, and, and in recording, it's hard to know when to stop, believe it or not, sometimes. No, I totally get uh, it. Uh, it's like, it's just like painting, you know, it's like um, one more stroke and you've ruined the <laughs> painting, you know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right, there you go. You've gone too far. But, uh, but Warren was telling me how uh, I told him something Tom Dowd said to, uh, 
to his engineer. Actually, Tom Dowd, by the way, mixed the first Cowboy album. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and and I was telling Warren how we, um, I was sitting watching him, and he had brought his own engineer with him down to Criteria, is where it was mixed, and. At certain times, you know, in the mixing, uh, Tom Dowd would sit there with his eyes closed listening to the song and and he would go to his engineer, who obviously was very close to him and uh, knew what what he meant. But Tom would say right here, right now, and he'd hold up his hand to the right side of the, of the listening uh, to, near the right speaker and say, I need yellow here now. <laughs> and I need to bring up the green over here on the left side as the as the chorus begins. And uh, all right, let's stay with this purple right here through the verse, you know. And he related everything to color, which is which is uh, kind of blue. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I've heard that from a couple of different people that have worked with with people and and you know, relate music to color and stuff like that. Yeah, there is a definite, uh, oh, it's, yeah, there is a connection. But uh, that made Warren uh, remember a story that Tom Dowd said to, uh, uh, Dwayne wanted to redo some, I don't want to, I don't want to tell a story wrong. Uh, Anyway, essentially, let's just cut it down to they were listening to a song and uh, and somebody said, well, we need to do that again. Uh, I need to do that guitar lick again right there. And uh, Tom said, I don't think so. But you go ahead. You go ahead and you go home and you listen to this overnight and sit back and listen to it like you've never heard it in your life and listen to it from that standpoint and tell me whether or not you think you should redo it. If you still think you should redo it, we will. And this is what he was uh, saying to to Dwayne. Yeah. And I think it was Dwayne. I'm, I'm sorry. It could have been Eric. I don't know, but I think it was Dwayne. And, uh, it's like, uh, Oh no, I see what you mean now. There's no need to redo that at all. Hmm. Yeah. But it's funny. Uh, that's another thing that's uh, always weird. As an artist, when you're listening to a playback, it's like John Lennon said, this was so funny. This is what John Lennon meant. You see, like when you're listening to a playback that you have done, it's like uh, you're so introspective about it that you can't possibly hear it like someone who didn't do it hears it you follow me yeah yeah totally it's like like when you write when you write a paragraph you craig write a paragraph you read that in a way that no one else w- would probably ever read it or think of it mm-hmm. and uh because of that john lennon said you know me, me and Paul and George and Ringo are the only four people on earth who have never heard the Beatles. Yeah. Yeah. I dig that. Right. Yeah. And it's completely true. It's like they never were able to hear the Beatles like everybody else did because they were the Beatles. <laughs> no, I totally get that. I am fully, I write ad copy. So I know, and I often write very long form sales letters and reports. So I get it. You got to go back with fresh eyes and you got to know when, you know, know when to hold them, know when to fold them, you know? So I I, I totally get it. And I think with music, it's, it's more difficult because, you know, you have no real estate limitations. You have, you know, and you can expand and expand and expand or retract and retract and retract. Yeah, exactly. Like Johnny Sandlin, for instance, was very good. He and I were in the studio so much together that uh, uh, he was very good at letting, you know, if I was doing a guitar solo, uh, you know, I'd always want to do one more, you know, just because I thought, oh, man, I almost had what I'm hearing in my head. I want to try it one more time. And Johnny would, you know, say, just like Dowd uh, did, um, 
Tommy, I think, yeah, that's it. You've done it. You did. And usually, um, uh, it was probably after, after about two or three takes, you know, and, uh, yeah, but after that thing- the third take, um, it pretty much was gotten and uh, I wanted to improve upon it. And, and uh, there was no reason to improve upon it because Johnny was hearing it and, and said, I don't know, you've done it. You got it. You know? Yeah. And I think that thing with the fresh eyes or in this case, fresh ears, you know, leave it for a day, then go listen to it. That makes oh, that's huge, very helpful. That's huge, man. That's I mean, very helpful. Cause you're so yeah. burnt out at the time and you don't realize you're burnt out. You think you're full of, piss and vinegar and you're like need yeah. to distance yourself that is the truth well, is that that is really true you you it's real hard to keep a perspective on when you are tired and when you are not progressing anymore you yeah, know totally. when you're waste it's hard to really tell after a while when you're actually wasting time um last time we spoke you mentioned and i think you said a few minutes ago that the early cowboy records are being re-released were you involved in that putting that together Oh yeah, very much so. Actually, um, uh, a guy named Scott Schinder who uh, writes for Real Gone Records, uh, he he seems to be the one they go to for writing the history of whatever their Real Gone Records. Um, they they put out you know records that are gone. <laughs> really and gone, real gone records. Real gone. <laughs> Uh, they're not just gone. They're yeah. real gone. Yeah. Uh, Gordon Anderson uh, and his partner, Gabby. I can't remember Gabby's last name. Sorry, Gabby. Uh, but the two of them uh, uh, are real gone records and they're really good to work with. They're very thoughtful and they want to put out top notch stuff and, so uh, I helped them out with old photographs and uh, history and, uh, you know, kind of this and that. Um, that and Scott Schinder and I, he, he interviewed me about this and that. And they have put two real nice booklets uh, in each of the two uh, releases. The Boyer and Talton album uh, is unto itself. And by the way, they're, it's called, they called it the expanded version because – they also got the rights from uh, Universal Music Group, who owns all that, um, all those recordings. Now, uh, they also added the two cowboy songs that were on the live laid back album with Greg. Um, my songs, um, "Time Will Take Us" and "Where Can You Go." That's cool. They, they are added to the Boyer and Talton album. Did they give you? A, they didn't give you a hard time about that. That's weird. Seems like record companies never like just accommodate anybody. Oh, uh, they they could care less now. I, you know, if if someone hadn't asked them if they had those songs, I don't know if they'd even know they had. Okay. I think that's fate. Uh, maybe that's negative, but I don't. I don't think so. I mean, the only reason they knew they had is because somebody said, "Would you look these up?" Yeah, you know? yeah. I, maybe not so much, but uh, there's a lot of people who work there. Most of the people who worked there weren't born when that came out. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. I and, uh, and also uh, another, what might be interesting to you is that the Boyer and Talton album, if you will look at the liner notes and who played on it, you'll notice that it's all the same people that played on the studio version of Laid Back with Greg. And actually – Laid Back and the Boyer and Talton album with Johnny Sandlin producing both of them were being recorded at the same point in time whenever we were all in town. Like if Greg was on the road with the brothers, uh, we would work on the Boyer and Talton album. And then if we were on the road doing a cowboy gig and Greg was at home, he would come in with Johnny and and work on some vocals or uh, an organ part on whatever on laid back and oh. yeah. uh, and so so the Boyer and Talton album and the laid back album those sessions were actually could be thought of as one entire session work hmm. interesting so 
I mean, so you guys were extremely close and like a, a fine tuned machine as far as playing with each other. Yeah, we uh, we we had our little man cave there, and uh, it just happened to be a fine studio. And uh, we had a helmsman, we had a captain, and we uh, <laughs> we uh, just played. You know, Toy Caldwell walks in the door, and you say, "Toy, Toy Caldwell, put a pedal steel on this. Put a I, pedal steel on this one." Uh, I haven't heard that it, name in a while. That's cool. Yeah, Toy was a wonderful guy too. Uh, Warren and I were just talking about what a great joke teller he was. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's how it was back then. Uh, we would like that uh, Happy to Be Alive album you were talking about. That It's um, actually uh, Talton, Sandlin, and Stewart. Um, the way that happened was uh, we were waiting for um, – Johnny was waiting for – Dickie Betts to show up one night to do some guitar overdubs on Ramblin' Man or something like that, Blue Sky. And uh, we, uh, he was a little late. And uh, finally, Johnny said, Tommy, you got any new ones we could record? And I said, yeah, I got two or three right here. And I played him one. And Johnny and Bill Stewart and I went out in the studio and recorded a song called Help Me Get It Out. And... Um, Johnny showed it to Phil Walden the next day, and Phil said, I like that. Why don't you guys do an album? There you go. And I've said this many times, but how can something like that happen today, you know? No, it, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. Rarely, rarely. Yeah, I don't. It's uh, Rarely. It's, yeah. But that's how that album started. And, you know, while we were doing it, we would be doing, oh, I don't know, we'd be playing a song and Drew Lombar from Grinder Switch would come in to listen because he had nothing else to do. And he was in the neighborhood and uh, and Drew would say, you know, Drew said, Tommy, let me put a guitar part on that section. I said, sure, hit it. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like. Could you have your people call my people? Uh, we're going to be needing some guitar work at three o'clock on Saturday. You know, so everything was just very organic. Organic falls together naturally, mm. and uh, I think that might be a lot of the uh, reason it feels the way it feels. Uh, it certainly was not uptight. You know, it, it was laid back. Oh, and totally laid back. Most man. of that stuff was. I remember a great line. We were working on a Livingston Taylor album once in there and John Landau was producing it. And, you know, he was, uh, he was hyped up from his New York city-ness and, uh, <laughs> he's a good guy and he was a great man and a good producer and a great writer and everything. I'm not saying anything bad about him. I just thought it was funny, but Livingston was doing a vocal and, uh, you know, he got a little hung up on one of the things that was it wasn't working right vocally, and and John Landau pushes the talk back button to to tell uh, Livingston out in the in the playing room. Uh, Livingston, don't get up tight. Just hurry up. <laughs> what a uh, wonderful wonderful yeah. way to settle a guy down. Huh? Yeah, don't get up tight. Just hurry up. Yeah. But I'm bump. Um, hey, um, you were originally from Central Florida? I was born in Orlando. Yes, I was. Mm. And I lived in Winter Park, uh, which is right next door. Sure. And uh, yeah, my family was from there. My uncles and my grandfather and uncles on my mother's side laid half the sidewalks and Drive cement driveways in Winter Park, Florida. What was your childhood like growing up? Oh, it was, um, I don't know. It seemed to be pretty smooth. I didn't, I don't remember too much going wrong, uh, uh, except for the fact, which is a pretty heavy thing. Um, my father was killed in a car accident when I was like five years old. And I'm sure that shaped a lot of uh, um, my uh, 
outlook on life and stuff. Yeah, I would imagine. Not only not having a father, but not, but, you know, I remember that certain aspects. Uh, he worked for Win Dixie, and uh, he was a supervisor for many stores in the Green Cove Springs, High Falls, Jacksonville, Palatka. It's uh, the northern Jacksonville area of Florida, back mm -hmm. in the 50s, and uh, and uh, but my childhood. Um, I don't know. I guess it was normal in most aspects. I like playing baseball. I used to in grammar school and from fourth to sixth grade, every Monday and Wednesday, I'd wear my little league uniform to school. So I wouldn't have to come home and change before I went to play baseball. That's how much I love. So you're into baseball. You said that. Let me ask you this. You know, we all pay tuition and make mistakes in our careers and what we're doing. And I was wondering if you might be kind enough to share one or two mistakes that you might have made along the journey and, and what were the lessons you learned from the mistakes? Oh, well, that's pretty easy. Um, I made the same mistake many of us made back then, uh, and that was um, overdoing substances Um because they were always around and there was nothing else to do when you weren't playing music. So sure. um, I, uh, I had a problem with alcohol, um, which um, I'm, I still drink a glass of wine here and there and, uh, but I don't drink any, I haven't had any vodka or anything like that in quite a while, but I drink uh, a beer here and there or a, glass of wine here and there but i i don't uh i don't mess with it anymore because uh it really did i i think to this day i probably still have uh there's people around that uh remember some of the uglier times from being screwed up on too much cocaine and too much alcohol and uh you know not to mention the moments that I lost uh, because I wasn't fully there. Yeah. Yeah. That's as you uh, get older, man, that's more important, isn't it? You know, that really is. Well, you, you know, realize yeah. you can make more money. You can't make more time. And you mentioned how my voice is now. And uh, I, I think if I had continued in that direction, uh, my voice would not be like this uh, singing voice anyway. <clears throat> Yeah, I was amazed that because so you're, there was a lot of it was you know a lot of high notes in there and it was like you know totally smooth, man. Well, thank you. I uh, actually I don't have the I can't go quite as high as there's some high notes on uh, like if I were to play you uh, five will get you ten right now. Um, there's some high notes in there that I would avoid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was recorded in what 1971. Yeah, seventy. Yeah, yeah. 70. So that's uh, forty-seven yeah. years ago, man. You get a pass on that one. And there was a, uh, you know, there was a song called "Patch and the Painkiller" uh, that was on the Boyer and Talton album that I wrote. That Scott uh, sang harmony with me on, like he did so many times. And um, the last few years, whenever we did that, there were some harmony parts that he had to change because he couldn't get up right up there where he was back then but the last 10 years uh, scott was pretty frail too so there were many reasons for that sure sure well that's that's understandable man um so basically if you had to go back and give your younger self advice outside of you know lay off the booze a little sooner anything else you might have given said to yourself assuming you're willing to listen um gosh yeah probably quite a bit um Pay more attention to what's going on around you at every split second that you can possibly be aware. Take everything in and save those posters you're walking on at the Fillmore East in the green room <laughs> because <laughs> later on they're going to be worth $4,000. Right now they're just garbage. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. I remember I, I looked at that uh, – there's a Fillmore vault or something. Yeah, Wolfgang's uh, vault. 
yeah, Wolfgang's fault. And I was looking at these posters and it's like, those were, those were laying on the floor of the dressing room. We were all walking on them back when we were playing there. Yeah, you know, because the gig was over. You know, it was like the next week, and uh, that was the past. It was a week ago. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? It's funny, funny it's- stuff. But um, you know, not to get off the subject, but that's one thing: is to just if boy, if you could just remember. I mean, not remember, if you could just be in the moment as much as you possibly can at all times, which is something to still try to do. Um, It's still difficult to do, to be in the moment and realize, kind of like record everything visually and and audibly what's going on. And so that you can uh, so that it's in in you and and, uh, can affect you, you know, I totally get it, man. I think that's one of those things you come to again appreciate more as you get older. At least, yeah, I, I it's have. like I think that's a part of that's why that's why they call it youth and why they call it uh, you know it's a uh, young, stupid, and you know you're <laughs> free. You're as free to be as stupid as you like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're primarily what a strat player? No, I, actually, I was up until the last five years or so. I've, I've been, um, I was given a um, a beautiful three thirty five by a very good friend of mine, and from that day on, I've been playing these Gibson things, and uh, I've got a, I've got an Epiphone Les Paul that I play a whole lot. Um, that I love. And I've, I've played up against people that paid, you know, six or $7,000 for their Gibson Les Paul. And I'm sorry, but it doesn't sound that much better. What, what year than is that? My, my $250 1994 Epiphone. Yeah. Les Paul. You know, uh, I've heard from a lot of people that those, you know, those, that era of Epiphones were great. They weren't made, where were they made? Then they weren't made in China, maybe Indonesia or Korea. I have no idea. You know, I'm not one of those guys that I never have been one of those guys that's like real into, you know, what amp are you playing through? You know, what kind of cable do you use? You know, what's uh, I, I've never have. I've kind of like again just kind of run across an instrument and, and it felt right and I played it. There's a lot of stuff I uh, there was uh, I used to have a an old silver tone guitar oh, with a, pop, a popsicle stick as a bridge. <laughs> and I played, uh, I used that guitar on some Alex Taylor recordings from his, uh, uh, what was the name of it? Friends and Neighbors album. Did you ever hear that? No, I haven't. By Alex Taylor, James's older brother. No, I have not, man. I'm not, I'm, uh-huh. that's not like my genre really, to be honest with you. Well, he was that came out on Capricorn also, and uh, Alex was a R and B singer. Man, he was not he was not folk oriented as James was. Although James James grew up on R and B too, which is easy to tell, you know. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, well, he's yeah, he's got it all. Mm, yeah, he really does. It's funny. I just saw a video of him on YouTube the other day making a. A travel, uh, you know, something about when you travel, and it was just kind of funny to see James Taylor making that video. Um, it wasn't about music, it wasn't about guitars, it was about when you travel in a hotel room, here's a little trick you can use. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, uh, so you're basically, you're playing 335, you're playing your 335 now, your Epiphone Les Paul, and really don't pick up strats too much anymore. I've got a, a, a Mexican strat that I, uh, that has some, uh, uh, I got it off Craigslist uh, for three hundred twenty-five dollars, and uh, it's a real nice tobacco sunburst color. But it's Mexican, and it's uh, it's got a uh, oh, uh, sorry, senior moment going on here. Uh, the pickups are uh, EMG pickups that come. In a uh, in a package, the 
the uh, the pick guard and the, and the volume knobs and the, and everything are all one piece. Sure, and you just stick it into the thing. It's uh, oh, it's David Gilmore. I was going to say it's a David Gilmore. Yeah, 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 it's a and David. And boy, Gilmore. that thing sounds great. Um, but I haven't used it in a while. Um, See now, you know Jack yeah. Pearson. Jack Pearson would say you paid two hundred dollars too much for that. Yeah, I know. Jack, <laughs> Jack likes his squire. <laughs> he told me he played it. His squire cost him 80 bucks. It was amazing. Yeah. That's the best. Boy, does it sound good in his hands. In his hands. Yeah, right. That's exactly. Well, that's another thing, too, Craig, is it like everybody talks about, you know, buy this pedal and, and play this guitar and, and it'll help you sound. Yeah. It ain't the guitar. We all know that. Yeah. It's yeah. the touch. It's the touch and the approach and the uh, wisdom behind the moment. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's where the sound comes from. Tommy, what, what's the most important things that you've learned about yourself throughout this whole journey you've been on? Oh, I've learned that I'm a very fortunate human being. I can tell you that I, um, I've always tried to um, to treat people right, um, although at times I haven't because of probably those substance abuse things. Mm-hmm. Um, the, but um, I have always uh, tried to treat people right, and um, I think it's coming around to me, you know, uh, I feel better now with myself and more comfortable with myself than I ever have. And I'm um, actually playing better than I ever have. And um, uh, hopefully writing um, better too. So um, Do you I've think- just learned that I, I've learned that I'm very fortunate and that I need to remember that. And when I don't remember it and when I don't remember how wonderful um the universe is that's when I start getting in trouble mm. and that's when things um, don't flow as yeah, well. yeah. and the, and and things like stupid worry come into existence that uh, are completely uh, have nothing to do with anything and are not helpful in any way and um so I just need to – I've learned that I need to remember how fortunate I am to, to have had the life that, that I've had and, um, and still have the chance to um, leave behind some um, – hopefully something that will help somebody else along the way. Do you think that some of the reason you're playing better than ever is tied to the fact that you're – you know, you're more comfortable with yourself than you've ever been. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. I would imagine. Oh. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's got everything to do with it. Um, yeah. uh, I never was also one, one of those players that tries to, uh, I mean, the ego thing with playing can get out of hand with some people sometimes, you know, the, there's nothing worse than there's no room for competition. And when you're playing music and, you know, you, you, we've all run across different people that, you know, while playing music where some people just have to, you know, like turn it into a uh, competition and, and that's just not music. I, I'll, I'll literally put my hands down by at my side than to continue that uh, yeah. approach. You know, no, it's, it's stupid. It's a, it's to, it's a childish, egotistical thing to do that has nothing to do with music, period. No, so, 100%, man. I agree with you. Um, and, you know, and you, uh, the way you live your life, I believe, you're drawn to the to the people who, who um, can – help you contribute to a more positive way flow in your life, you know? So, um, that's again, comes back to try to always be aware of being in the moment, you know, Mm, for sure, man. Hey, when you're having a bad day, what do you do to turn things around? Um, 
a lot of times I'll just go to sleep. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, you know what I was doing right before our interview, I went out and, um, like when I get uh, mental, when I get mental blocks about writing or if I am feeling down about something, I'll go out and mow the lawn or, uh, clip bushes or, um, uh, do some carpentry work, saw some wood, nail mm. some wood, screw some screws, do all that physical stuff that, I, but still use my hands and uh, just get all that energy out of me. You know, yeah. Because the only, only reason you're feeling bad is because it's all pent up energy. So it seems to help me anyway. Uh, and and it feels good. I've always loved. Uh, I guess it comes from my. Um, my D, it's in my DNA from my grandfather and uncles about work. You know, my uncle Frankie, I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, I saw him in August in Florida carrying eighty pound bags of cement on his shoulder. Nice. And how old is he? Yeah. He was eighty four then. He's, he's since passed, but uh, he was working up till the day he died, um, laying tile and brick and painting and. All kinds of stuff. What's your biggest business or personal win, Tommy? Oh, wow. Getting back together again with uh, my wife, now Patricia. Getting back with her is my biggest win. She's she's the, one of the biggest reasons I have... Uh, uh, gotten so much calmer and more um, relaxed and feeling right you know that's awesome man that's really nice to hear congratulations on that um, that's, that's also some very good brownie points you do realize when she listens to this oh yeah well that's <laughs> <laughs> but I know, you're, that. I know you're being sincere man I am. I know. And uh, you see, we were together in 1980 and then went our separate ways. And she had a daughter oh, wow. um, uh, in 1986. And uh, we got back together when I moved back here from Europe in 2001. And, um, and now her daughter, Kathleen, is just as much like my daughter as – my daughter. That's awesome, man. That's a real nice story. So y'all were apart for 21 years. Yeah. Wow. That's a cool story, man. And got back together and got married. And now you've been together for like 17 or 17. Years. Yeah. Man, congratulations. That's really cool. Thanks. Yeah, it's great. Good for um, you, man. Good for both of you. Yeah, it's great. Um, there was something too. Yeah. Oh, did you have another question? I, I, yeah, I was, I was what's that? I was just thinking, I was saying when I moved back from uh, Europe, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, when I came back, I didn't, I had never, I didn't know who the Dave Matthews band was. I missed pretty much the 90s in America. Uh, and believe it or <laughs> not, Dave Matthews wasn't, wasn't heard that much, not when I was there uh, in the 90s. Uh, uh, you that's know. that's un, that's surprising, man. Yeah, it was funny. At least I, of course, I didn't listen to radio that much. But uh, I, when I came back a couple of months, I used to come back every four or five months just for uh, three or four days, you know, um, just to say, hey, back when it cost three hundred and fifty dollars to fly from Brussels to Orlando, Florida. Yeah, well, uh, those days are gone. That's the taxes on the flight now from Brussels to Orlando. That's the luggage. Yeah, man. Yeah. But uh, anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, it's all good. Um, do you have any hobbies? You mentioned, you know, like gardening and, and uh, some carpentry stuff. Do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music? Uh, mostly just uh, carpentry and painting, you know, like painting pictures, uh and and actually, I think of writing and and uh, painting and playing as my hobby that I I'm just fortunate to be paid for sometimes. Sometimes, 
I hear uh, that. It's pretty boring, really. I, I, no, I'm not. I, I used to like. I can't tell you as much as I was into baseball back uh, in my youth. I, uh, I can't tell you very many players nowadays. Not like uh, old Colonel Bruce could. Hmm. We would. He could tell you what, uh, you know, what day. <laughs> what day Mickey Mantle's foot hit first base on his 3000th hit or something, you know, but you, you just like casual, more of a casual fan. Yeah. I, I don't even, I don't remember the last time I watched an entire baseball game all the way through. I'd love to go to a live one. They just built the new, uh, Mercedes Benz stadium, right? 10 miles from my house, uh, where the Braves For play. The Braves? Yeah, where the Braves and the Falcons play. Yeah, mm. if I was for some reason my son and I, my younger boy and I, we always go to a Tampa Bay game. For some reason, we're always going to see them play the Falcons. I don't know why. It just seems to be the game we see every year when they come down here. Yeah, so you're in Tampa, right? Yeah, yeah. Knowing life is precious and time is not infinite. What's the one thing most important to you as far as like what you're doing with your time and making sure you're using it? whatever time you have left wisely? Well, that's, that's a real good question, which I can answer because, uh, another thing is, is I never, I never thought of time and I never thought of, uh, yesterday and tomorrow. I, 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 but lately I have been since I just turned 69. I, I was thinking, you know, uh, just the other day that, um, let me see that rebelizers European CD that I made um, seems like I did that just the other day. Well, for that matter, it seems like just the other day I met, I was doing, uh, I was on the road with Greg doing laid back to her. But, um, and by the way, when, when you hear, when I hear old recordings that I played on, I am in that moment just as if I was sitting in the room when it was being done. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, how, uh, it's, it's said how the sense of smell can bring back memories yes. very strongly. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same thing with listening. Uh, when I hear a recording that I played on something by Billy Joe Shaver or, or whatever, mm -hmm. I can I can remember what the room looked like, you know, and who was standing where and, and all that. But um, thinking about time and how much uh, – how quickly it moves um, like that rebelizers record I, I, I made um, with the guys in Europe. Um, that was in 1995. That was 23 years ago. And I swear it feels like it was just last week. And, and if I look ahead in that amount of time, I'll be 93 years old. <laughs> And I go, wow. I mean, that puts it into real, real life perspective right there. I mean, it's like, wow. I mean, I remember playing in 2009 at the Beacon Theater with the brothers. And that seems like yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And that already was what, uh, uh, 11 years ago? Mm-hmm. I saw them at the Beacon in 2011. Funny. Yeah, I think I, I may have played there then too with them. I don't remember. Maybe it was 13. I forget. But, um, uh, but that perspective, you know what I'm saying? Is yeah. like when you look back to, uh, like when you were telling your daughter uh, when she was six. That seems like just the other day. I'm sure. Yeah, it does. And how old is she now? 18. Just turned 18. Yeah. And, it, and it's like that was 12 years ago. And yeah. in, how old are you? Uh, 54. Yeah. So in 12 years, you're going to be 66. Yeah. But you still won't be as old as me. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> no, it's it's all fine. It really is. Um, I've been very fortunate with having uh, good health, um, too. So, um uh, I think my heart rate great. usually beats at about 48. Holy shit, man, you'll live forever. <laughs> but 
but garlic and garlic and uh, olive oil and avocado stuff like that really it's all do good a stuff for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've always, you know, being being a ta- half Italian, my mother was a great. She was always in the kitchen making something and. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with my health, the genes, the genes and the, the way that she uh, fed us and all that. I, I don't know who knows, but I'm fortunate. That's for sure. In many ways. So the one thing that's most important to you is staying grateful. Is that what you're saying? Basically? Yep. Um, um, that would be the most obnoxious thing I could do is to, uh, <laughs> is to start forgetting how fortunate I am. And uh, so that's what I try to remember every moment. I'm getting better at it, but always room for improvement, right? Man, for all of us, absolutely. Hey, I want to thank you very much. I want to tell people uh, where they could find some of the stuff you're doing and uh, what they should listen to and look for. First of all, it's Tommy Talton. He's the founding member of Cowboy, Boyer and Talton, play with Greg Allman on uh, the laid back album and the laid back tour. And he played a song on the Allman Brothers, uh, Brothers and Sisters. You can buy his latest album, which is called Somewhere South of Eden. It's a really nice album. I mean, it's, it almost sounds like if Cowboy kept going on, you know, it was just like. <laughs> Well, thank you. Very, you know, nice. Just laid back, nice music. Rock, but, you know, more like that California rock. There's rock in there. Yeah. There's a little bit of jazz, too, with me and Chuck Lavelle on the Poblano instrumental, if you've heard that. Yep, I sure have. I like that one. And also, there was rock on. It's going to come down on you, for sure. Uh, You can... Check out Tommy's music on his website at Tommy Talton, T A L T O N music.com. And also it's available on Amazon. Cowboy has just released two of their records, the last two, Boyer and Talton, and the album Cowboy itself. And in 2008, 10 years ago, probably hard for you to believe this. Yeah. Uh, the original members of Cowboy got together. And that album is coming out this summer. And the name of that album is 10 will get you 20, which is a sort of a a takeoff on their hit album. Five will get you 10, which is a great, great record. If you It's inflation. You know what I'm talking? I hear you, man. Shit goes up and uh, that's it, man. I I appreciate your time. Did I miss anything or anything else you want to talk about? Oh, that seems fine to me. I, I, I uh, hope you have something there you can use. <laughs> Listen, man, I appreciate all your time and, and thank you very much uh, for everything. And uh, thanks for all the great music you put out over the years. And uh, you're a real sweet guitar player and I enjoyed listening to you. Thanks a lot, Greg. That means a lot to me. And I, um, let's just stay in touch, man. That's all good. The next time you come down to Florida, let me know. You got it. In fact, uh, I was just talking to someone yesterday about that possibility, so I'll let you know. Let me know. Go have a cigar. If you smoke cigars? I can. (laughs) We could could have coffee and cigars. There you go. And Italian food. You got it. (laughs) Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Many thanks again to Tommy Talton for uh, spending his time with us and being so cool and sharing all these great stories. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com, sign up to get our newsletter and to get some special offers. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. (laughs) 